Hi everyone, thank you for being here for week 10 of our course, Poetics of Anticolonial Joy. And today our conversation, I think, takes on a very, very interesting aspect. Um, our conversation on, on rest and refusal, right? Um, and we're going to look into a movement today. I say this because we're going to look into a movement today that happened in Brazil in 2015-2016, which at this point feels like a different century. Um, and the movement that I'm talking about is the student-led high school occupations that spread across the country in those years. In this lecture today, I'm going to try to trace some connections between this movement um, and ideas of refusal and our weekly readings. Now, about the readings. Um, for this week, I've included one paper about these school occupations, mostly to give you some material to read about it in case you're interested, and the chapter Errantry, Errantry Exile by Edouard Glissant, as we discussed last week, and the poem For Survival by Egyptian-French Lebanese poet André Chedid. Now, um, to start, I think I'm going to suggest that you already pause this video now and watch the videos that I have linked in our folder for this week. The first one gives a short explainer of the occupations and the following two show students singing Brazilian funk songs, which is a, a rhythm that I guess is referred to in Europe um, and I guess the United States too as baile funk. We call it, we just call it funk in Brazil. Um, and uh, yeah, in these uh, songs, the students um, are demanding better education funding, the end of the police, and asserting their rights and needs and so on. It's quite beautiful, um, and it really never fails to uplift me to watch those, those videos and see those kids um, doing this. And the third link is a music video from hip-hop group Armand Hammer's latest record, Shrines, which was a, one of my 2020 favorites. So take a moment, pause here, watch the videos, and then come back, okay? I'll wait. I'll just like pretend that I'm waiting. Okay, good. Now that you've watched the videos, I'm assuming, I wanted to say that um, the school movement that I, that I mentioned will be kind of our starting point or perhaps like our, our red thread through some of the central issues that we're going to analyze this week and to, that we're going to discuss this week. And I wanted to list them already. So these, these key points are, there are three, errantry, education, and the refusal to stick to a predetermined or expected trajectory, rootedness and universalization as keystones of the colonial process, and the joy of collective acts of refusal and of living in relation. So let's start perhaps with a little bit more context about the school uh, occupations, the school movements, uh, particularly for those who are not familiar with it, who are not Brazilian, I guess. So in late 2015 and early 2016, a number of cuts to education were being made by right-wing state governors in Brazil, particularly in the states of Goiás and São Paulo. Now, these cuts were part of a, a broader trend, really, um, 
of a successive and a successive process of privatization and depolit depoliticization is that even a word of public education in Brazil a process which is still ongoing uh, right now and has obviously been continued quite enthusiastically by the Bolsonaro regime. On September 23rd, 2015, the governor of the state of Sao Paulo, Geraldo Alckmin, you might have noticed that the kids in the third video were referencing him by his first name, Geraldo. So um, the governor of Sao Paulo state announced this project to restructure the school network, which consisted of separating the school units so that each one began to offer, so that each school began to offer only one of the education cycles, that is elementary school, middle school, and high school. This proposal would also determine because of this, it would determine the closure of 94 schools, which would supposedly house other educational functions. This would cause about 311,000 students to change schools and affect the jobs of 74,000 teachers. Now, in October 2015, also, the governor of Goiás, Marconi Perillo, signed a decree in which he determined that the State Department of Education, Culture and Sport should make a selection of companies interested in a state school outsourcing program. What this would mean is that basically the state schools would... Um, start to be managed by companies, and indeed, one of the um, one of the things that the governor said to the press was that business people are better administrators than the educators themselves. Now, in response to these measures, these honestly very extreme measures, students started occupying some schools in both states mirroring something that had happened already in Chile a few years before, in protests meant to demand free university education for all. It called the attention of the media, of course, um, kids occupying their schools like that, and slowly more and more schools started being occupied by students, also because these problems, as I said, um, were not uh, local necessarily. Budget cuts in education had been happening for years uh, all over the country and particularly affecting state schools and of course um, public schools. Um, so by early 2016 also, and this is also an important factor, a massive corruption scheme was uncovered linking a number of politicians and other public servants to the embezzlement of public funds destined for school meals. Now, in, and I guess this is a, a little bit of context that is also necessary to drive home the, the, the cruelty of this. Um, in a country like Brazil, where food insecurity is, is really widespread, School meals are very often the only meal that a child will have in a day. So, and that's why also um, a lot of people started calling the politicians involved, including uh, Geraldo Alckmin, the governor, um, school meal thieves. At the time, we were witnessing... Um, a buildup, really, of pressure and opposition to the administration of President Dilma Rousseff from the Workers' Party. Right-wing parties and organizations had been waging a relentless campaign against her administration. 
And in April 2016, the Brazilian Congress voted to start an impeachment process against her um, and remove her from office pending an investigation into the financial practices of her administration. Dilma had been the political successor of President Lula, the founder of the Workers' Party, who uh, brought key changes to Brazil in the early 2000s over the two, his two administrations. And, I, I mean, although a lot can be said about the concessions that the Workers' Party made to right-wing demands during these administrations, both, um, both Lula and Dilma's, um, the, these worker parties' administrations enacted policies that changed, really, the face of the country um, and really lifted millions of people out of abject poverty and guaranteed a lot of workers' rights, particularly to uh, the most vulnerable workers, and also facilitated access to a higher education. And of course, all of this, all of these things were huge, massive problems for the oligarchy that has effectively ruled the country since the Portuguese invasion. So by June, in this like increasingly um, unstable political climate, Senator Magno Malta presented um, in the Senate a bill um, called Bill Bill Number One Hundred Ninety Three in um, yeah in the Federal Senate, a bill that is also known as the School Without Political Party. Meant and this was a bill that was meant to prohibit teachers and professors to promote so-called biased politics in the classroom. Effectively, this bill would ban any form of progressive political discussion in class, um, and that goes for discussions related to queerness, anti-coloniality, racism, classism, all of this. And obviously, you know, when when I mention this, when I when I bring this um, here into this classroom, I cannot help but think that. If made into law, a bill like this, um, I mean, this, this very course that we're, we're taking right now, this very lecture, um, would fall under the legal definition of bias. Um, and I would not be allowed to teach any of these things that we are discussing right now and that we have been discussing throughout um, the semester and also in the past semester. The work of educator Paulo Freire, um, also as part of the kind of like media campaign that surrounded this bill, um, which is a huge influence to me. The, the work of Paulo Freire is a huge influence to me. I have mentioned that already. And also to so many other educators, um, his work was vilified as being leftist propaganda. And that was the key of this bill, right? Um, any such discussion on all the issues that I have mentioned, queerness, racism, classism, etc., all of that was considered propaganda and all of that was considered a biased um, version of reality. And the, the, um, the way that this bill was presented and kind of sold to the, the media, which um, where it had a significant support too, um, was to was that this would prevent any political bias in education. So as of 2021, um, this project has been put in the back burner, largely because of a, of course, massive public outcry. And without any doubt, the school occupations were responsible for calling attention to this issue. So by 2016, as this bill was being pre presented in the Senate, the movement had absolutely exploded with students um, ultimately occupying over a thousand, a thousand schools over the country. 
all over the place. I'm also very, very proud to, to say that my old public school in Rio was part of the movement and it was also occupied. The occupations um, were characterized by super interesting horizontal forms of organization. Um, there was no uh, central leadership. And they functioned in ways that, to me, feel very, very similar to communes. As these teenage students, we're talking about kids, right? As these teenage students learned to live together without the supervision of adults, they divided tasks from cooking to cleaning to communicating with parents and the media, um, mobilizing and organizing via social networks, also with other occupations, um, and managing their supplies, and so on and so forth. And they had, they did have a strong support from large swaths of society too. Some people provided food and other necessary essential items for the occupations. Um, artists and musicians mobilized to offer concerts and performances and there was such a beautiful network of solidarity that we saw kind of emerging around, around that movement. As you saw in the videos too, the students composed songs, um, they wrote journals and essays and poems they performed and danced together, they created theater plays and documented the daily lives in the, their daily lives in the occupations with films and photos. And on that note, art was also a key aspect of their politics, right? And classes were obviously suspended as long as the occupations went on. Students also put out calls for volunteers who could teach subjects that they were interested in. And that included stuff like gender and queer studies or anti-colonial um, histories of Brazil, anti-colonial um, um, perspectives on the history of Brazil or critical race studies. It was truly, truly amazing to see that happening. And there were plenty of volunteers um, in, and that to me was so incredible to see that in an autonomous and self-organized way, these kids found all kinds of manners to continue their educations, um, also in, in ways that would have been impossible if they had refused to accept the conditions imposed by the dual threats um, of hegemonic educational models and the defunding of public schools. And I also think that, you know, when I was that age, damn, I, I, I wasn't nearly as articulate or as knowledgeable as these kids were. And it was so impressive, truly impressive to, to see them um, able to, to do all of that together and learning the power of that. And I think right now it's also important to um, really highlight, you know, we're getting into this conversation, um, to highlight that public schools in Brazil exist under extremely, extremely precarious conditions. As I mentioned, I, I studied in a public school and I remember so, so clearly growing up um, all of the teacher strikes that sometimes meant that we would not have class for one or two or even like three or four months. Or I remember going to the front of the house of the governor of Rio to protest for salary raises for the teachers and school and university workers. Or also the time when there wasn't enough money to hire a physics teacher for six whole months. So we lost six whole months of study of an important subject. 
or when our school had to be relocated and this oof, this was a lot when our school had to be relocated because the local drug dealer um, gangs invaded our former building and then we ended up because of this we ended up spending years years temporarily housed in the state university building which was absolutely not an appropriate um, uh, an appropriate situation for a whole school and that also happened because of insufficient funding so that gives you I mean this is when I tell this to people here in Europe they think it's madness but it is part of um, of the experience of growing up in a public school going to a public school in Brazil so knowing this context and the extreme conditions that public school students um, face in Brazil this movement was as I said like it was one of the most beautiful and moving things I've seen by the end of the year, the of that year, um, the occupations slowly started to end. And the reasons and the ways in which this happened um, are, of course, particular to each state and region and municipality and so on. In some cases, the deoccupation process of the schools involved violence and acted upon those students. And let me stress minors teenagers kids and that so that were targets of violence by the police and the state an example of this happened in the capital brasilia where a judge authorized the police to cut electricity water and gas lines to a school as well as and this blows my mind as well as the use of LRADS, which um, that's an acronym for Long Range Acoustic Device. LRADS are sound weapons that are often used by police to disperse crowds in protests. In this case, it was used for sleep deprivation, which is a strategy that the United Nations has repeatedly identified in reports as a form of torture. And, of course, the, the school was occupied, I mean, was deoccupied, and the students had to leave. How do you, because, of course, you know, how do you handle a situation like this? And cutting, indeed, cutting access to supplies was widely used as a strategy to trigger the deoccupation of schools in the country. Which, I mean, I, I see that essentially as a form, as a version of siege war, of a siege war, right? And in some cases also, like in many Sao Paulo schools, the military police which is a thing that exists in Brazil um, and it is an unfortunate um, inheritance of the military dictatorship that we had. So the military police entered the schools, which they cannot do unless they have a warrant, of course. They entered the schools, violently, violently removed the students, physically removed the students and arrested them. And here I want to say again that we are talking about kids, about minors. And there were cases, of course, um, where the deoccupations happened peacefully as a result of more or less successful negotiations with local gov governmental bodies. And, of course, the movement, you know, even in spite of the violence enacted, the, the cruel and cowardly violence enacted upon these kids by many, many uh, governmental bodies, the movement did achieve significant victories. In Sao Paulo, for instance, the governor had to give in to the pressure and postpone the closure of the schools. I mean, the optics of removing forcefully removing kids and uh, and uh, um enacting violence upon kids 
obviously are not good in by any stretch of the imagination. So this, the postponement of the closures was a historical win for, for the movement and truly an incredible demonstration of the power of grassroots organizing. Unfortunately, the victory was relative, was quite brief. Um, by 2017, Governor Alkmin had managed to advance kind of a covert version of his initial project, which ended up closing almost 900 cl classrooms while also, also, and this is key, opening up 2,000 new spots in state prisons. There is a connection there. And it's here that I think it's useful for us to transition from this like little piece of history in Brazil to look into the broader structures that Glissant engages with in errantry and exile. So circling back to, sorry, I think I touched the microphone. Um, so circling back to the questions that I had said that we would be looking at today, let us kind of take that back and look at them again. So the first question I mentioned we could consider today um, was about errantry, education, and the refusal to stick to a predetermined or expected trajectory. Now, thinking about the connections between errantry and refusal and the context of the story, it's impossible not to be reminded about the predetermination of certain life trajectories under capitalism and capitalist models of education as the closure, the simultaneous closure of 900 cl classrooms and the opening of 2,000 spots in, in prisons clearly illustrate. So the, the role of hegemonic educational models within public schools in this context is to produce workers, right? Kids coming from the working class and that will stay in the working class and potentially also um, end up in the prison system. People whose bodies are destined to serve and, and be exploited for the benefit of the oligarchies that have always ruled the nation. And of course, when we think about oligarchies and the maintenance of class structures, we're talking about class, of course, but we are also talking about race and gender and ability and so many things. Like in many other places, like in, and, and also Europe, I have to say, poverty in Brazil is racialized and it is gendered. The oligarchies that I mentioned are the heirs to the Portuguese and other European settlers who have historically held power and wealth in the country and maintain themselves as distinct from the mass of racialized others created through the colonial process and continued through the project of the modern nation state, of a westernized nation state. So in the chapter, to, to bring us back to, to Glissant, in the chapter that we read for today, Glissant reminds us, and this is a quote, most of the nations that gained freedom from colonization have tended to form around an idea of power, the totalitarian drive of a single unique root, rather than around a fundamental relationship with the other. Culture's self-conception was dualistic, pitting citizen against barbarian. Nothing has ever more solidly opposed the thought of errantry than this period in human history, when Western nations were established and then made their impact in the world. And it's here that I see, and like reading this, it 
it really makes me see the beauty of errantry in this movement. The refusal to stick to that script, the script that determines a life path for these kids, for their families, for their communities. Errantry here takes shape as a process or several processes, multiple processes of learning together, of truly living and practicing rhizomatic thought, of rejecting the educational model that reinforces competition and the hegemony of arrow-like trajectories in the world. Those kids knew what they needed to, to learn and they, they asked for it. You know, when I think about, when I mention rhizomatic thought and a, a rejection to the root in favor of errantry, I'm thinking about the ways that they rejected this hegemonic educational model that would put them in this pipeline in favor and, and demanded the education that they, they needed. Um, also through this, for instance, this volunteer program, they said what they wanted to study, what they were interested in, and they fought for a critical education. And thinking about that, Glissant writes, and this is a quote, Errant, he challenges and discards the universal. His generalizing edict that summarized the world as something obvious and transparent claiming it for one presupposed sense and one destiny. He plunges into the opacities of that part of the world to which he has access. Generalization is totalitarian. From the world, it chooses one side of the reports, one set of ideas, which it sets apart from others and tries to impose by exporting it as a model. The thinking of errantry conceives of totality, but willingly renounces any claims to sum it up or to, process, or to possess it. And this here then takes me to our second point today, which is a conversation on rootedness and universalization as keystones of the colonial of colonial processes. In a conversation with Derek, with poet Derek Walcott, which I have linked in the extras document in the folder this week, Glisson says, thinking about the roots of identity processes in Western cultures, my conclusion is that at first these processes needed a kind of opaqueness. I call it opacité, translating from the French. A kind of opaqueness was needed to oppose and reject the other and to have some écran screen between identity and other. In Western cultures, there is no myth, no great myth that includes the other. All the myths are out for myself. Yes, there are myths that include the other, but not at the roots of Western culture. I think that what we need today is not an epic for my identity or your identity or his identity. We need an epic for, I'm sorry, we need an epic for the fragile and dying identity of earth and mankind. This is the identity we have to look at. And I can realize this identity through my identity. I do not have to abandon to renounce my identity, to realize this mankind's identity, which is agonizant, dying in the throes of death. One of the great, great, great tasks of this time is to understand the other, to live with him, or to accept him. And I will claim for me and for you and for all the right to opaqueness and to opacity. You can be what you are, and I don't need to understand that or to reduce you to a transparency, to live with you or love you or accept you. Now, one of the 
key, as I mentioned, one of the key talking points of the right when defending a project like the one that I mentioned, the School Without a Political Party project, was to attack the work of Paulo Freire. And, and I, I already um, mentioned that, but I, I bring that back because, um, of course, you know, wh what is the reason for that? Why that specific re rejection to one of Brazilians, Brazil's most famous and respected thinkers and educators? Well, obviously, the whole philosophy behind his educational program focused on emancipation and nurtured a relational understanding of the educational process. So in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Freire remarks that very often oppressions become sedimented and kind of ossified, imprinted in the oppressed's own mind. And this is part of the process through which people are stripped of their humanity and agency. So the pedagogy of the oppressed, he says, is a humanist approach to learning, which must be formed with, not for, the oppressed, whether that be individuals or peoples or communities, in the incessant struggle for, for humanity, for to regain humanity. So this pedagogy, um, this is a quote, makes oppression and its causes objects of reflection by the oppressed. So in that way, they foster the political engagement that constitutes the necessary foundation for liberation. Freire also warns us that emancipation and liberation cannot, however, and this is very important, cannot be bestowed by others. Rather, they must emerge as a result of the oppressed, of a, a process in the oppressed that he calls conscientização, that is, the process of gaining conscience about one's humanity, even in face of adverse circumstances. And here he says, not even the best intentioned leadership can bestow independence as a gift. Liberation of the oppressed is a liberation of women and men, not things. Accordingly, while no one liberates himself by his own efforts alone, neither is he liberated by others. That is, only in relation, and only living through the poetics of relation, through living the poetics of relation, that we can truly become free. And I see such a clear connection with the work of Li Sang here. So starting from an understanding of pedagogy as a political endeavor, Freire reasons that in order to combat systemic and persistent inequality, a radical shift in educational models is crucial. And that's why he proposes the, what he calls the educational project as an alternative to traditional education. Educational projects are problem-posing endeavors in which people, are, people cultivate their power to perceive, and sorry, this is a quote, their power to perceive critically the way they exist in the world with which and in which they find themselves. They come to see the world not as a static reality, but as a reality in process, in transformation. So thinking about that, revolutionary education then, of course, cannot subscribe to, um, to a, a hierarchical model of education that he calls the banking concept of education to draw a line to um, capitalism, right? He and um, the way that he defines this banking concept of education, which is the hegemonic model that we're used to, um, is a model where the, the educator deposits knowledge that the students then collect and dispense upon demand, that is, through tests and so on and so forth. And so what he argues for is that the authoritarianism that constructs this, hier this hierarchy between student and teacher needs to be left behind so that all involved parties may be responsible for the educational process. <laughs> 
And thinking about this also takes me to our last point for today, which is about the joy of collective acts of refusal and of living relation, relation in the glissant kind of um, concept. So thinking about education as this kind of horizontal process, um, well, I guess that the practical manifestations of that are pretty clear in the, the story I told you about the occupations today. How in refusing their expected roles and predetermined trajectories, these kids manage everything from press relations to maintaining the schools in a livable state to feeding everyone. But I also want to know, or I also want to talk about art and how making art was a fundamental part of this how the songs they, they wrote in one occupation would be performed then by another one, how music spread across different places, also like in, um, in large, um, and obviously um, social media played a, a large role on this. And also I wanted to bring up the playfulness and the sheer joy of it of performing and singing together and dancing together and how that was also key to keeping the movement going. There's something so, so powerful about the catharsis of making art together and performing, performing collectively. And those kids, of course, they knew it. And I guess, as a side note, I guess this is also something that we're missing a lot in this particular historical moment, right? This, the power of collectivity and of being together and doing all of this together in one space. But anyway, that's another story. Um, what's key here is that these artistic expressions developed by these kids during the occupations also spoke to a wholly different way of navigating the language of education and educational models. Back to Glissant, he writes, In contrast to arrow-like nomadism, discovery or, con or conquest, in contrast to the situation of exile, errantry gives on and with the negation of every pole and every metropolis, whether connected or not to a conqueror's voyaging act. We have repeatedly mentioned that the first thing exported by the conqueror was his language. Moreover, the great Western languages were supposedly vehicular languages, which often took the place of an actual metropolis. Relation, in contrast, is spoken multilingually, going beyond the impositions of economic forces and cultural pressures. Relation rightfully opposes the totalitarianism of any monolingual intent. Now, opposing the totalitarianism of monolinguality, the homogeneite, oh my God, what a horrible alliteration, I'm sorry. So opposing the totalitarianism of, homone of um, monolinguality, the homogeneity at the core of the colonial process and the predetermination of trajectories in capitalism is, as we have seen with the occupations, really not an easy task. A revolution is, of course, a long process. And as Angela Davis says in the title of one of her books, which we will read soon, freedom is a constant struggle. And throughout this struggle, we need to find ways of caring for one another. So to kind of close our reflections for today, I wanted to end the class by reciting the words that Audre Lorde speaks at the end of the Armand Hammer track that we had today, the music video that you watched. She says, I have to tell you guys, I need to perhaps talk a little more about survival. Because when I say that, I have heard people say, oh, but I'm not content, content to just survive. And implicit in that response 
is a certain denigration of what survival is. That is to say, they reduce survival to a mere existence. And that is not survival. None of us are going to move the Earth one millimeter from its axis. But if we do what we need to be doing, then we will leave something that continues beyond ourselves. And that is survival. Thank you so much for being here today and for um, staying until the end. I hope you've enjoyed this class and I'm looking forward to discussion. See you.